Another element that we need to talk about with color is complementary colors. All right, so for that, we need to take a look at the color wheel. Basically, what you need to remember about the color wheel is which colors are across from each other. So you've got the primaries there, red, yellow, blue, and the secondaries, orange, green, and violet. So the colors that are opposite each other are referred to as complements. Uh, the reason that they are complementary, that name kind of comes from um, talking about light and how these different colors, when they're added together, create white light. So they complement each other. But in, in painting, we're actually dealing with the pigments. And as those are added to each other, they're kind of canceling each other out. So if you choose two of those complements, let's say it's red and green, and you mix those together with a little bit of white, you'll start to see a particular kind of gray uh, happening. And the same will happen if you mix orange and blue or violet or purple with yellow. Uh, they will cancel each other out and create a particular kind of gray. Uh, people kind of call that a chromatic gray, a gray that's got color in it, right? Not just black and white. The reason that this idea is so helpful is that whenever you are presented on your palette and you're mixing and the mixture that you've created is just too intense, too saturated, and you can tell that you need to take away some of the saturation or intensity, you can add some of your complementary color. So let's say your mixture is, we'll just talk about those mountain shadows again. If, those, if that mixture is too intense, too vibrantly blue-purple, if you add a little bit of a yellow into that blue-purple mixture, it will start to take away some of the intensity. You might even be able to get away with orange in that scenario since those mountain shadows are pretty blue. So keep that in mind as you're mixing on your palette. So another piece of this idea and the reason that I found it, another reason it's so helpful, talking about the light on the mountains. I don't know if you noticed as I was mixing that color, you can go back if you need to, but I was mixing viridian green, alizarin crimson, and white in order to create a gray light color back there. Now that color also, I think I added a little bit of the yellow ochre, maybe even a little of the bismuth yellow or that cadmium lemon in order to warm it up just a little. But what's so amazing about that, that complementary mixture is that that red-green combination creates that gray that you can kind of warm up a little bit in that distant light on the mountains. And right next to those cool, more intense shadows, you end up with that feel that you've got this light hitting the mountains. So that's a good uh, example of using complements to create a particular kind of gray uh, for the painting. So just memorize those colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, and that'll help you a lot as you are adjusting your mixtures that are too intense.
as I'm working here in the sky area, getting that blocked in, I'm trying to make sure I let some of that undertone yellow ochre color show through. I was trying to do that in the mountains as well, and at this angle, you can't quite see, but there are a few places in the mountains where some of that yellow ochre is still showing through. You might call that a broken color technique, where the color that you're adding on top is sort of broken apart so that that color underneath can show through. Uh, I do that uh, technique quite a bit. And what I found is as long as the values are close, in other words, the, the value of that undertone and the value of the color you're painting on top of it, as long as those are close, you won't end up with hopefully a um, distracting kind of effect. If those values are close together, then it's mostly just a color change that's happening in a few places. And what I like about that in a sky area is it really sort of ties things together. It, it kind of allows that sky to relate in color a little bit more to the middle and foreground warmth. So that's where that yellow ochre color comes in um, really handy in this type of scenario to, to create some, some harmony. Um, so I think that that's that technique, that broken color technique is a helpful one to think about. You can do obviously all sorts of different colors underneath or just paint right on the white canvas. But I think uh, the color that you choose obviously will also do you know, make a big difference on what your painting is going to feel like at the end, if you allow that color to show through. Uh, on this piece, I actually, you know, by this point, the, uh, the tone is pretty dry. It's not real wet. So it's not mixing together too much as I'm adding this color on top. That's the real challenge with a tone is just that it wants to mix together. So if you're doing it outdoors, plein air painting, You've got to be pretty precise and purposeful with your brush strokes and the way you're laying the paint down so that the colors don't just mix together, especially in a place like this. For example, when I'm doing the clouds, you know, it's very easy for that light white color to just mix with the color underneath and start to uh, get affected by that. So you've got to get the color on your brush, lay a few strokes, and then dip back into your pile of color and lay some more strokes rather than just fiddling around too much on the surface of the canvas so that those colors don't just mix together. So I'm uh, blocking that in. Let me talk for a minute too about the clouds. You know, the clouds are not in my reference photo. Those were sort of invented <laughs> by me to, to kind of improve the design of what I hoped would improve the design of the piece. So you can just copy the shapes that I did there if you're painting along and um, see, or you can invent some different ones if you want to do that. But I like placing different cloud shapes in a design idea because you can kind of put them wherever you want. You can make them big or small. You can let them go off the edge. You can make a lot or a few. There's just a lot of a variety of ways you can add clouds to affect your design. So um, the other point having to do with color with clouds is be careful about just using pure white. You can see there as I mixed my light white color for the clouds, I added some yellow ochre to it because I wanted warmth there knowing that those clouds are getting hit by the sun, just like the other light areas in the painting, the clouds also have to have some warmth to them. So a little bit of that yellow ochre really helps. It doesn't, the color doesn't have to look yellow ochre. It's just a little bit of warmth in that white. So be aware of that. Whenever you're painting something white that's hit by the sun, you've got to have some warmth in it. You've got to have a little bit of of warm color in there. And then with the shadows on the clouds, 
I've been kind of studying those for a long time, trying to take mental notes as I see them outside, as I look at paintings of them, photos of them, you know, different cloud scenarios. And what happens a lot is the shadows on the clouds really aren't a lot darker than the lights. In fact, sometimes those cloud shadows are even lighter than the sky value. So it's mostly a color change. It's a slight value change, but it's mostly a color change that's creating the shadow uh, on those clouds. And what that does is it helps the clouds feel nice and light and airy, not heavy and dark with too much contrast. So keep that in mind as you're painting clouds. The idea of the warmth on them in the light and the shadows on them not being as dark as you might think. There are, of course, times where shadows on clouds are pretty dark, but I think there are a lot of times, too, when they're brightly lit that the shadows are, you know, lighter than you might think they are to create that lighter feel.